I presented the entrepreneurial worldview fully born, if you will. Um, but in actual fact, I had to understand that by looking at what entrepreneurs actually do in a, in a micro level, if you will. So um, in my research, uh, I talked to a, a, a whole bunch of, uh, you could call them successful entrepreneurs, but success was only a part of their story. I call them expert entrepreneurs. These are people who had several years of founding experience of multiple firms, often success and failures, and they had learned to perform well over time. So they had taken at least one company public. So of course people see them as successful entrepreneurs. And when you study how they think, and I gave them a 17 page problem set of typical startup decisions that all entrepreneurs uh, have to make in starting a company. So I got to see at, at the micro level the kinds of things that they do, uh, not just the whole worldview of how they think, but how they implement that worldview in, in their practical day-to-day -day business problem solving, if you will. And I found a series of things that they do. Uh, and I wrote about five uh, of these, the five principles uh, in my book, but I suspect there are more. Uh, and I think uh, as I teach and I look at more uh, histories of entrepreneurs and I talk to them, I think there will be more. So I don't want to talk about this, that these are there are only five principles, but I can give you some examples. So one of the things I always talk about to my students and uh, is, is about cooking. <clears throat> now I say there are at least two ways of cooking. One is to start with a, a dish that you want to make and where you have a great recipe, you go get the ingredients and then you know you make the dish. The other way, the way most of us cook, I think, is we stumble into the, ref uh, into the kitchen, open the refrigerator and find stuff. And if you come into my house, you'll find you know, things, brown powders that you might have to smell to know what it is in them because I make Indian food. Uh, and then, so you kind of look at what you have and then you try to make something with it. The interesting question here is what difference does it make whether you cook using a recipe and proper ingredients or whether you stumble into the kitchen and cook something. Um, it, uh, it depends on how good a cook you are, you know, what you end up cooking. Uh, so you can't get away from the basic ideas that you need to understand about running a business. So you still need to know how to manage your cash flow and things like that. But when you just stumble into the kitchen and cook, what happens is, assuming you know how to cook and you're a good cook, you're much more likely to come up with a new dish that even you might not have actually planned to make. Uh, whereas if you're cooking from a recipe, it would be, uh, you would get that dish, right? You wouldn't get some uh, new dish. And that's the interesting part of it. So it's not really a question of this is better than that. It is just that the way entrepreneurs do it, they work with what they have. Uh, and they look around and say, what can I do with this? And then what else can I do with it? So it goes back to the idea of doing the doable and then pushing it. So they just look around at the resources that are available to them. And by, by resources, I don't even mean money. A lot of the entrepreneurs I studied start with things like who I am, what I know, and whom I know. So they're looking at what kind of a person, person am I? What kinds of things turn me on? What kind of things, you know, that, that I just will not do because it goes against my values. So they have a sense of self. Uh, they know what they know, and very often they're very good at knowing what they don't know. Uh, so they look at what they know and don't know, and they look at the people that they know, and they uh, start talking to the people almost immediately, and they bring them on board very early on. So they work with what they have to create something new. So that's a technique, and there are lots of um, uh, techniques connected with that that we can learn and teach and it's very useful in the classroom. The second thing that they're very good at doing is to think through in deciding what to do with what you have. Uh, they're not really thinking about where, you know, will I get the biggest bang for the buck? You know, which one is likely to lead me to the most profit? Instead, they constantly ask themselves, you know, would I do this even if I know I'm going to lose what I'm investing in it? which is a very different criterion, uh, financially speaking, for example. And I call that the affordable loss criterion. 
And a great example of that is, uh, you know, there are people who have good jobs, right, pays 100000 200000 a year, who leave and start a company. Now, the standard gut reaction is to say, oh, my God, they are, you know, entrepreneurs are risk takers. They are just risk loving. You know, they like jumping off buildings or whatever. Um, but in actual fact, when you look at how a lot of these entrepreneurs uh, make decisions, especially the experienced ones, they're not really saying, you know what, I'm making 200000 today, but I believe if I do this, I will make $20 million and therefore, you know, I'm just going to invest everything I have. That's not the way they think about it at all. They think, you know what? This looks like an interesting thing to do. I think I would enjoy doing it. I've always wanted to do this kind of thing. Um, so I think I can put 50000 into it and six months of my life. What's the worst that will happen? Maybe, you know, uh, I have left the job and I'm back on the job market and maybe I don't make 200000 I make 150000 But if I don't do it now, when will I ever do it? I've always wanted to be my own boss or I've always wanted to build a heart monitor because my dad, you know, died of a heart. Whatever the, that thing is that is moving them, it comes from who they are and what they know and whom they know. It's very close to uh, what they already have on hand. So that's kind of the second thing. And the third and most important thing is that they work with people. Uh, and they work with people in a very interesting way. They don't go and say, you know, here's something I want to build, you know, Gadget G. And this Gadget G is going to change the world. So who do I need to bring on board? And I go and sell this and I'm so good at, you know, I'm so charismatic. I'm such a good salesperson. I bring people on board. No, no, no. What they really do is they are very good at getting you to tell them, you know, what would you want to do with Gadget G? They allow you to change their vision of Gadget G if you are willing to put skin in the game. So they build this network of stakeholders who actually put stake in the ground. And each of them, you know, invests only what they can afford to lose. So the affordable loss works with this stakeholder thing in a very interesting way. So what happens is since each person is putting real skin in the game and they're deciding what to put in based on something they care about so much that they're willing to lose. So the affordable loss does two things. On the one hand, if you fail, it keeps failures really small, something I talked about earlier. But on the other hand, it gives you a different way to evaluate an opportunity, a different way that does not depend entirely only on profits that you would do this for some reason, some reason that you have, even if you lose the money, you would do it. Whatever that motivation may be. Uh, it could be something as simple as I can't stand my boss and I just want to. It could be something as simple as that or it could be very lofty saying that, you know, I really wanted to help women back home and I want to do this venture because it would help them and it's okay in, in the process I try and fail. So the motivation can be anything but the logic is kind of the same in each case. Mm -hmm.